So today we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject, statistics and testing. And we're going to get, by the end of the video, starting to think about how do we apply statistics in the practice of genetics. So the specific topic of today's lecture is the chi-square test. which many of you have probably used at least once before in other classes, but maybe not. So we're going to start from the beginning. A little motivation. Let's say I have a coin, and I flip it four times. Yeah, let's make it simpler. Let's say I have a coin. It's got two sides, of course, and I flip it twice. And I observe, O, oh, that I see heads twice, and I never see tails. How convinced could you be, how convinced could I make you, that this coin has two heads? We've never seen tails come up. So you don't get to see the coin. I flip the coin behind my back, and I tell you if it was heads or tails. So you can't examine the coin. You just know that I flipped it twice, and both times I had heads. It's probably not very convincing, right? There might still be a chance that by chance, I flipped it twice and I just haven't seen the tail side of the coin side of the coin yet. So what we have now is the start of an analysis that's of the chi-square type. We have an observation and we want to know the question is, is there a significant difference between the observed values? We see heads twice and tails never, and what we expect. The critical part of the chi-square test and most statistical tests is we need to have an expected value. We need to know what was expected, what we observed, and then we compare those two statistically to ask if there's a difference or not. So what would your expectation be? If I have a two-sided coin and I flip it twice, then I should see, on average, heads half of the time and tails the other half of the time, if it really has one side as heads and one side as tails. So now we have observed and expected counts. Numbers of observations, never frequencies. So you can do a chi-square test with whole numbers. This is how many observations that we made. We could not do a chi-square test if I said that this, for example, was the value 1 for 100%, 0 for 0% of the time, and 0.5 for 50% of the time. Doesn't work. Can't use fractions or decimals or percentages. This has to be just numbers of observations, not then turned into pre frequencies, percentages, and so forth. So two heads and zero tails observed. We expect then, if flip, coin flipping is random and this coin really does have heads and tails, one heads and one tails. The chi-square test compares the observed and the expected values as follows. You take the observed value for each of these two categories, so two categories, heads and tails. The observed heads minus the expected number of heads, square that, divide it by the expected value of heads. And then for every category, that's the category one, heads, we add the exact same formula for every subsequent category. So now we're talking tails. You observe numbers of tails, expected coin flips that would result in tails, square that, divide it by the expected number of tails flips. And the total of that is the chi-squared test statistic value. So if we plug these numbers in, we get we observed heads twice, expected once, and we observed tails, not at all, expected to see one. So 2 minus 1 squared is 1 divided by 1 is 1, plus negative 1 squared is 1 divided by 1 is 1, so we're adding 1 plus 1. Our chi-square value is 2. There's only one other piece of information we need, aside from the chi-squared test statistic value, to know if there's a significant difference between two heads and zero tails and a one-in-one -one ratio. 
And that is we need to know the number of degrees of freedom which is the number of categories minus 1. So in this case, we had two categories, heads or tails, subtract 1. Degrees of freedom equals 1 in this case. With those two pieces of information, the chi-square test statistic value and the number of degrees of freedom, you can then compare or look up those two values in a p-value table, the chi-square distribution of, of p-values to find out the p-value associated with a chi-square value of 2 with 1 degree of freedom. And I'm going to tell you now, I can't show you the table right now, but you should definitely look this up. 2 degrees of freedom 1. The p-value associated with these results is greater than 0.05. Where p ranges from 0 to 1. And a p-value greater than a 0.05 means there's no significant difference between these two numbers. In other words, it's not important that we saw heads twice and tails zero times and expected one to one. No significant difference, p greater than 0 0.05, means that it's very likely that we never saw tails just by chance. And if we flip the coin a third time, we would probably see tails. If we kept flipping the coin, we would definitely see tails as long as that coin has a tails side. So here's the next question. Let's say we kept flipping that coin and we flipped it four times. And we saw four heads and zero tails. What's the expected value? We expect heads if we see four total observations, we would expect to see, on average, heads twice and tails twice. So what I'd like you to do is plug those values into the chi-square formula, observed and expected, two different categories, and then tell me what the chi-square test statistic value is. And when we're in toge class together next time, we'll interpret that chi-squared value, the p-value, and discuss what it tells us. So a couple of points to wrap up. First, when the p-value is less than or equal to 0 0.05, that's when we do something called rejecting the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is just our expectation, our guess. And we were guessing or assuming that this coin had a head side and a tail side. And it's only when the p-value is smaller than 0 0.05 that we would reject that hypothesis. We would say, you know what? we now have enough evidence to suggest that that coin probably doesn't have a tails side. The p-value 0.05 could be tr translated into a percentage. That's about 1 in 20, or 0.5%. 5%, 1 in 20 chance. What does that mean? 1 in 20 chance that we see if, for example, in any situation, that means there's less than a 1 in 20 chance that we see very, very different numbers, but that our expectation is still true. So it's p less than 0.05 when we reject the null hypothesis, which means that there's a significant difference. If we find this, there's a significant difference between the observed and the expected values. Remember, we have to use whole numbers, observations, not fractions, frequencies, or so forth, to set up a chi-square test. Sometimes we'll find situations where there's something weird that happens. So for example, if we flip a coin three times, we might observe two heads and one tails. So what's the expectation here? The expectation is that we would see one and a half heads and one and a half tails, because each of these rows has to sum to three. And we've got a 50-50 chance of getting a heads flip or a tails flip. Even though it's not actually meaningful to say that you get one and a half heads flips, you keep those fractions, those decimals, in the expected values. You never round. Always keep those decimal points there. And finally, what we're doing is we're going to use these chi-square tests in genetics to ask the questions of when we see genetic map information, 
we have expectations that we're going to have observations of numbers of recombinant gametes. We're going to have, based on Mendel's laws, expectations of how many recombinant gametes we should get. So the question to you is, and we'll discuss this later, what is the expectation for independent assortment in meiosis? How are we going to calculate when we observe numbers of different types of recombinant and parental gametes, how are we going to arrive at the expected value? And we'll talk about that in class.